Okay, everybody, thanks for listening to another episode of The Creative Truth. My name's Tyler, I'm your host, and today I'm talking with my friend Sarah, Sarah Coletta, and she is an old friend of mine we met in college, and she is a, I want to say a UX designer out in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So that is just two letters that make no sense to a lot of people. Um, Could you, Sarah, just introduce yourself and tell everyone what you do? Sure. Hello, everybody. I'm Sarah. Um, so I do user experience research more than design. Uh, and incorpor- I incorporate a lot of design and research, but I'm more research focused. Um, I moved out to Indiana after grad school to work for a company called Vera Bradley, who sell those really bright, creative bags that you probably see at every airport or on every college campus. Um, and so for them, I was in charge of doing a lot of user testing. So like understanding our users, what their needs are, what their goals are, and the easiest way that we can help them meet those goals. Just as a user experience, anything, designer, or researcher, your main goal is to put the user's needs first and put yourself in their shoes to make any, anything that they want to do more seamless. So whether that's visiting a website or like actually shopping and adding to cart, or it could even be the interface in your car, like making that more easy to use. Hmm. So a lot of different industries do you, and now, um, so what are you doing now? (laughs) Now I do user experience research for a hospital system, healthcare system. And that's a lot harder to describe. (laughs) So I always wanted to do something in healthcare. And originally I thought I was going to be a neuroscientist or a neurosurgeon. And then I realized that that's probably a little too lofty of a goal. And I also really like technology and research. So I figured that was a good path for me. And so for the hospital, we are involved in a lot of like program evaluation, like helping different departments evaluate how effective like different programs are or their workflow or their systems just to make every, like to make their work processes more seamless and just so the hospital works. I don't know. I don't know how to say it. So uh, (laughs) is it true that like, like from what I'm getting from this, for Vera Bradley, you were more front end user facing, like customer facing. Yes. And then for the hospital system, it's more back end with like the actual doctors and people that work in the hospital. Or is it yes. also for the. And sometimes customers? it involves the website and like the customers for the website. Or like if we have to add things to the website, just like who, who we're trying to target. And we also have apps like. People can go on and check their charts through their app. So just figure, and sometimes there's problems with that. Like um, if they have a hard time logging in, we try to figure out why and how, how we can fix that. Or if it's a brand new feature that they're being introduced to, like what's the best way to educate the new users on how to like onboard and how to get going with it. So is this like scientific method type thing where you're like, we think this could work better and then you implement it and then you test it and then measure or how's that, how do you kind of find what's going to. I mean, every, every project that we're brought is different and it has different needs. So we have to approach them all in a different way, but overall for user experience, you start with like background research and identifying like what your user your users need, what their goals are, how you're currently doing things, and how other people in your same kind of sort of space are doing it, just to see kind of like a competitive analysis of what other people are doing, what what works for them, and how it might work for you, or how you could kind of like tweak it. Um, then next, I would bring it to bring my ideas and my research to the UX designer. And so when I was at Vera Bradley, I, I would sit very closely with her and we'd go, 
I, if she had more of the creative eye and the Photoshop skills, I did not. And so I'm, and I never really took a lot of designing classes in, in school. So I know what looks good, but I don't always know why. And I don't know, like if I sit down by myself, I wouldn't be able to just like pop out a, a mock-up that looks great right off the bat. But I could sit with her and say, based on what I found, why don't we move this here or try this color instead kind of thing. And so once we get a mock-up like that, then we would send it out for testing and test it with real users to see and give them different tasks mm-hmm. to see like, if it's usable, if they can accomplish those, like the goals that we anticipate that they're going to have, if there's any major errors that we can fix. And it's really an iterative process. So you test, you fix, you test, you fix, you test. So what are, other than like sales, what are some other KPIs or metrics you're basically looking for to know that you're, what you're, whatever you're implementing is successful? Um, sometimes I think it depends on what industry you're doing it for, because everyone's going to have different success measures. Um, a lot of times for, for us in the healthcare system, it's more of like adoptability. Like are, are the users going to be using, are they going to use this feature and like satisfaction and ease of use? Cause if, you're trying to make everything easier for them because you want to empower them to like to take hold of their own healthcare and you want them to be able to do things on their own as easily as possible. Are there any so, either in your industry or outside of your industry, any like gold standards of here are places, here are companies or websites or apps we always look to as like they're doing it really good. So we want to try and emulate them. Um, that's hard because now that I, I am in user experience and I, I'm constantly always thinking in, in the design way, <clears throat> I look at every app with like, what could I fix on this or any interface? What can I fix? It's but me with movies. Yeah. Yep. But I do think that, I don't know. I love Pinterest. Pinterest did it great. You just, when you're scrolling through, you're using your thumb. You just tap down with the same thumb you're using and it pops up a menu of you can pin it, you can like it, you can send it. It's all already there. You don't have to like, I hate the apps where you're holding your phone and you have to like use your thumb and go up a different way. It just, it's not natural. So the ones that follow the most natural flow of your scrolling or hand placement, I think those are, for me, those are the best ones. Is this some sort of total recall thing you have going on? Oh my on? gosh, I forgot. I got Hannah tattooed last night. Okay. <laughs> I forgot when I talk with my hands. Well, you kept saying your thumb, your thumb, <laughs> and then it has all these little markings all over it. Oh yeah. Looks They're good. feathers. They're feathers. Nice. Yeah, my coworker is from Bangladesh, and so his wife did this for me last night. So we had a, a working session. Cool. Um, sorry (laughs) no no I was the one that threw you off Um, can you kind of explain the difference like there's a lot of terminology and even within UX you you, you mentioned the difference between design and research but how about um, UI HCI I mean like what are some of the different related fields and what's kind of like the things that they have in common or the things that separate them right Um, so UI is user interface and so user interface and user experience are different. So user interface focuses more on like the structure of the interface. Like here's how the buttons are laid out and the functionality, but user experience encompasses everything. So it's like how the, the journey of how you get to certain pages and the placement of certain text or how much text to put on a page based on knowing like knowledge of the human visual system and attention, like how, how much we're actually going to be willing to look at before we get frustrated and leave. So that's the difference between those, but they do go together. Like they're both important. So if you just have one with, you just have a user interface without the experience, it, it'll work. Probably. (laughs) It'll, it'll function, but it might not function as well 
as it could and it won't be a great experience for them. And the goal is if you want people to keep using your product. Yeah. The adaptability so. you're mentioning. Yeah. yeah. And then how about, um, how about mm-hmm. a human computer interaction? And then the, I think the old term is like human factors. Is that, am I right? Um, there are two different things, but so human computer ac- interaction in my definition, <laughs> since that was th- the degree program that I did for my master's. Damien um, Schofield. <laughs> Damien Schofield, shameless plug. <laughs> um, yeah, originally I was just going to go for neuroscience, but I met with our old professor, um, Aunt David Vampola, who is probably the most brilliant man that I've ever met in my entire life. Second. And he was like, I don't know, maybe you should go sit, go talk to Damien for a while. And anyone that sits in the room with Damien signs up for this program. Like by the time you're done, he's convinced you and he's just great. But so human computer interaction took what I learned in my undergrad about psychology and cognitive science and like how our brains work and how we perceive the world and colors and stuff like that and applies it to interface design. So it's to me, it's a lot of psychology integrated with computer science. Yeah. What you do, what you do is also like relate directly related to the sales division and the marketing division. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it's an interesting. Yeah. Like sister or cousin of marketing. Yeah. And our job is to bridge the gap between like marketing and the business and the developers because they don't always, those two groups don't always talk great to each other or like understand each other's side of why their goals are what they are. So we're kind of the liaisons between those two groups. So, oh, go ahead. Uh, I don't remember what I was going to say. So for this podcast, for a little background for you, uh, a, a big part of this is, talking to creative people to figure out how to be successful in their respective fields. So for you, how are you making the majority of your livable income? Um, Because I'm talking to a lot of artists who do a lot of things or um, maybe people that want to focus in one thing, but they have to have like a, a, like a regular, you know, job to, Mm -hmm. to fund their art. So how about, how are you surviving? Solely from, doing user experience at one company. I've thought about doing some freelancing projects on the side, but I just don't have the time. And by that, I mean, I actually do have the time. That's a lie. Um, (laughs) I just feel like if I spend all day on the screen, I don't want to spend all night on a screen too. Like I need to have some, some variance or else my eyes are going to betray me one day. Is being, oh, go ahead. But some people, I do have other friends that do it completely freelancing or, but mostly it's just like you find a company and you're part of their UX team. Like there are other like agencies that do it, but I'm not from, I don't think that I am familiar with anyone who does it for an agency. Yeah. You answered my question. I was going to say, do people typically work salary or do they also freelance? Um, What are some of the, like the big breaks other than getting into or talking to Damien and getting into the ACI program? What are some other big breaks in your career that kind of have led you to where you are now? Hmm. (laughs) Well, some people say it was more like gradual small steps, but other people are like, when I met this person or I had this conversation that changed my whole trajectory. Right. I'm not really sure. I think that I'm one of those people where it's a bunch of little things that led up to it. So by, I started off as a marketing major and then took brains, minds, and consciousness with David Vampola. And then I realized I like brains. I don't like marketing. What am I doing? So I took those classes with him and started taking more like biopsychology classes and then eventually went on to do HCI. And as, as, as like a graduate certificate, I also did integrated health systems because I was still interested in healthcare and I didn't know anything about health systems. And I was like, well, a lot of these classes overlap. 
So I might as well take a few extra and learn. And I met one of the other professors who got me involved in some research projects with her. And I think that's what really helped was having those research projects for me and having those to add to my portfolio. So when I went to Vera Bradley, I'm not really sure what they liked about me, but I'm happy that they did. (laughs) And I think one of the good things that helped me with that job is that the the manager that was hiring me was actually from Buffalo. (laughs) So we had a lot of upstate New York-y things to like, bond over. Mm -hmm. And so like having that connection, I think was also helpful. So then by the time I went to go meet with them, I was more comfortable and I fit in with the team. But once I went to Parkview to the hospital that I'm for, I'm work for now, having some of those research projects from grad school, they loved that. And they wanted to know more about that because that's mostly, it's a lot of what we do there. Like we do a lot of research that gets published And so they wanted to know that experience there, but having outside industry experience was valuable to them because I could bring a different perspective than maybe what everyone else who's been working in healthcare for longer can bring. So I know it's weird when you think about it, you're like all the things that got you to where you are. What if one thing was different? And it's, it's, it's almost like a, clear path when you look backwards but when you look ahead it's hard to know what the it was like it felt like this <laughs> uh-huh. it was not a direct path at all so um but i will say yeah that my mom as when i went into marketing at first my mom's like find a job that's going to support you that you know is going to be stable and once i she's like make sure you find something that you're good at And then you find a way to get paid for it. And I realized that I'm really great at overanalyzing and overthinking and questioning everything. So I found a way to get paid for it. (laughs) You answered my next question, which is what kind of people or character traits are good at what you do? Um, People who are, who ask lots of questions. Like you want to know why all the time, why and how. Who and what, understand the world. Like you're not scared to ask those, like the hard questions. You're not scared to like shake things up a bit, which can be kind of hard in certain industries and certain companies when things have been done the same way for so long. It can be really hard to be the person that is suggesting the change because not everyone's receptive to that. But also, so also people who are like, you have to be pretty empathetic. You have to always be putting yourself in the user's shoes and thinking like them and what could benefit them the most. And sometimes it can be exhausting (laughs) to think like someone else for so long, but it's worth it. So can you do a little forecast and is there anything like on the horizon technology wise or industry wise that is going to kind of change the game for you or for people, um, whether it's on their phone or on their computer or the way that they consume content or interact with businesses? What are some trends that you're seeing? Hmm. I do think that a lot of the way that we learn about new things is all, at least we prefer people our age is mostly through our phones. And so I think that's how we consume a lot of new information when it comes to like new, new technologies and new like devices sort of thing. I'm not really sure. So not everyone's going to be wearing VR headsets in 2023 and walking around like that. Oh, I'm sure we wouldn't wear headsets. They'd probably put them in like little contact lenses and have your head up display there. Wouldn't that be something? Yeah, like Black Mirror. Mm Mm-hmm. I love that show. It's scary, but I don't want... It's it's scary because it's not that far of a reach into the future that these things could happen. And did you see Boston Dynamics just sold? I can't remember who. 
Yeah, they they just sold. They're the ones doing all those those. Uh, you're familiar with them, right? Yes. They're, yeah, they're doing all the robotics testing, and they first they had mm-hmm. like a humanoid robot on cable packs. Well, now they have the humanoid ones and the dog ones, and they were they have self-contained battery packs, and they can what? jump over obstacles, and they can run, and you can push them, and they'll react on different terrains, and it's pretty. And I, they actually mm-hmm. made a Black Mirror episode about the the dog type robots that Boston Dynamics has developed. So, yeah. So who knows where that's gonna. You know, it could mm-hmm. be, it could be, well, are there any other shows or um, media that you watch just like in that same vein? Recently I watched Upload, which is on Amazon Prime and it's about uploading your consciousness b- right before you die. So you can, you go into like this virtual afterlife, but you have someone here who's like your angel that keeps you connected but and they bring up a lot of interesting things so like you have to have a lot of money to go to some of these like afterlife communities and it's so like how how do you know how much money you need to have and who pays for some stuff after you die like do you, you leave that to your estate to take care of i just had so many questions after this was done there's only one season so far but and there's different things like within the afterlife, like the virtual community that you, you have to buy. So they have different credits for things. And if you run out, they, and they send you to like the 2g dungeon. So you get two gigs a month where basically all you can do is just like breathe and move around. So I had some really interesting (laughs) hypothetical ethical questions. And I was like, and I remember in my transhumanism class with Damien, we talked a lot about that like the different theories of what the future will like. And if you can upload your consciousness, it just seems wild to me that you'd be able to. Yeah. There's a, I mean, that could, that's what's so interesting about. And for the listeners, I actually have no idea what I'm talking about. I lived with Sarah (laughs) when she was in the program. So I know just enough buzzwords to make it sound like I know what I'm talking about, but actually I have no idea, but it is interesting because it is related to psychology and computing and biology. And there's so many like things that it touches what you do. Mm -hmm. Um, Engineering. And and something I've actually thought about with this podcast specifically is it's almost like the more your the more media you're creating, the more times you're photographed, the more hours of um, audio that exist of your voice, the easier it is for artificial intelligence to then um, synthesize your image or your you. voice. Yeah, so like like the deep fake technology, basically. And so basically, by putting myself on camera for hours and hours and hours, I'm creating uh, an archive of what I look like on certain days in my life. And I'm not like thinking about that all the time, but it is interesting to know that like this recording could live on indefinitely and, uh, you know, mm-hmm. beyond, beyond, way beyond my lifetime. So it is, uh, you know, a fun thought experiment to just kind of think about, you know, where we could go down the road. You know, somebody uh, didn't, uh, Kanye get Kim a, a deep fake of her dad to speak to her on her birthday or <laughs> so. Now they're divorced, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's pretty weird. So let's see. In twenty twenty one, how how would you like to grow and expand your skill set? Well, this has been a goal of mine for a while. I want, my, I plan on taking some of those. I think you pronounce it Udemy. Mm-hmm. Udemy. Mm-hmm courses. I bought a bunch a couple of years ago when they were on like a Black Friday sale just to brush up on my coding because I've focused so much on like usability testing and that research that I've lost what feels like all of my coding abilities. And well, because if you don't use it, you can you lose it. So and I don't like that I I can't do it anymore. Not that I really need need to, but I feel like it's a good extra tool to have in my tool belt for whatever I decide to do in the future. I don't know. So I plan on doing some of those. Um, 
through Vera Bradley, I actually started doing the Nielsen Norman user experience like certification. So Nielsen Norman, Nielsen and Norman are two guys who ba- who literally wrote the book on user experience. And they have a group, the Nielsen Norman group, that does like evaluations for for different companies. They have trainings, conferences. So I've gone to a couple of the conferences and done a few courses. And you have to do five to become certified in it. And you can take, there's different tracks, like the management track, the design track, research, and a couple others. And so I'm not specifically trying to stick with one track. I want to take a bunch of different courses. So I did an analytics one. I've done information architecture, which I actually found pretty interesting, and the usability testing one. So my goal, I mean, I'm not sure that in 2021 we'll actually start having actual conferences again, but I do want to complete that. I, I don't know. I'm one of those people where I always, I love learning so much that I thought that I was just going to be a career academic, and that, that if I went out into the real world, I was going to fail miserably. And I was great at school and great at learning, and that's what I was going to do. And I just want to, I don't know, I just want to learn all the time. There's so much out there for me to learn. Well, maybe down the road, academia is on the table for you. No. No? I would go back. I would love, that's kind of a, a long-term goal of mine is to get back in academia. I thought about it. I thought about going back for another master's or my PhD. Because a lot of the people that I work with currently have their PhDs. And... And I always want, like I, I did want one. I did want to go for one. But the more I think about it, I don't know. I don't like teaching. Like I like teaching my friends or like teaching other people what I know, but I'm not trying to teach a whole class. Yeah. For, I don't know. That's just not my thing. I would like teaching on a higher level, I think. You know, like kids that actually want to, young adults that actually want to be there and not, mm-hmm. you know, like, a 100 level course where it's just like 200 people and it's like very and they're still like, drunk from the night before right. they don't care yeah, that was, that what was you're me. trying to say <laughs> um and i we, going, we never did that no that wasn't us um going back to uh nielsen nelson um I, I that name popped out in my mind and i was like oh i remember nielsen uh was the ones that did the ratings the tv ratings um where people would actually get a box and they'd hook it up to their TV and then it would report back to Nielsen. And I believe now, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, or you can send me an angry email. Uh, the other one for radio is called Arbitron. I think I just did a quick Google and I think they're actually uh, converged now, but now with everything being, you know, streamed, it's much easier to kind of get uh, ratings of what people are watching and listening to. And, uh, but yeah, it's the same, it's the same people, I believe that, uh, kind of developed the rating system for television. Interesting. Yep. So there's a little See? tie to broadcasting. Hands everywhere. Bet, huh? Yep, exactly. So for what you do, mm. um, is, you mentioned a lot of peers have PhDs is college necessary is, it required, uh, what level of education for young listeners who are interested in, if, if somebody's listening right now and they think everything you said is absolutely fascinating and they're somebody who is hyper analytical and, and maybe overthinks things a little bit too much and that's what they want to do. How do they get started? Should they open ended? So what I've seen personally, I don't think that you have to go to school for this, like with the internet and like different courses that are available on there, you can just pay like $150 and take a bunch of those courses and learn it. A friend of mine, Trudy Holler, she's out there. Um, she worked at Vera Bradley with me as a, um, product designer and she would sit with me pretty often and walk through my process and there, our design processes were very similar. They just applied to different products. So hers were like physical bags and mine were web features. And she actually got so interested in it that she took some of those online classes like through Udemy or I think that was the one that she did. And she would call me up and ask me some questions. And I was like, this is so exciting that you're trying this out. 
And she's actually going back to school for that now. So I think that you can learn a lot through those courses, but the job postings still require you to have at least the four-year degree. And they'd list four-year HCI degrees, like bachelor degrees. And I didn't know that those were available. Or I don't, and I don't know where they're available, but I thought that was interesting last I saw. And depending on what level you... I mean, if you're starting out as like an associate level, I think they still just want you to, to at least have that four-year degree. So does that mean you like kind of regret going through the program or are you happy with the choices you've made to get you there? I am happy with every choice that I've made. I'm even the ones that meant that I took out the max student loans and I'm still repaying that. I just, I don't know. I think that the, the professors that I learned from were the ones that I needed, needed to learn from. And I don't, I mean, personally, I don't learn well online. I've taken some online classes and I did not do great with those because I need to be physically in the classroom, in the front, asking the questions. And I'm more of an auditory learner. Mm. So I, I learn by listening. And so like just being there right in front and hearing, I think was more helpful for me, but different people learn in different ways. So if, if they are someone who can just learn online, do it. Yeah. And that comes with kind of save yourself un- some money, understanding yourself and knowing how you, how your brain works and how you learn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I was never but, a note taker. Um, I was, I know I wrote everything down. My hand would cramp and it'd be like stuck like this for a while. I have blisters on my fingers. But yeah. So I don't know. I feel like the pro- the professors that I learned from, I needed to learn from, and I'm glad that I did. And there's st- like those, co- and I think that those connections too help you a lot. It's like I'm still in contact with them. They're my Facebook friends, and we send each other like different videos or like different TV shows to watch that are that we think are interesting and stuff. So I think beyond just what you're learning. like that applies to your career. You're still, I don't know, like the other connections you make are valuable too in school. But school's not for everyone. What does the uh, future of your industry look like? Is it in, is it expanding? Is it kind of stable? Is it contracting? That is a great question. I, think right now we're stable. I think a few years ago, there weren't as many people in this, in the UXE realm as like the, within the tech world. I think that now people are starting to understand the value of it more and more people are going into it. As for the future, I have no idea. I've thought about this. I've sat down many times and thought, what will my job look like in the next five years, 10 years? Will my actual position even exist anymore? Because, like with the rate that technology changes, who even knows? I, I, would, I, I would argue that while technology is continually changing and evolving, the fundamentals of what you do are rooted in just human behavior. behavior. So you'll have a head start on whatever the technology is. Um, so as long as humans stay relatively the same, <laughs> unless, <laughs> um, might be okay. unless we get, unless Neuralink makes leaps and bounds and we're, we've kind of, uh, we're going to transcend uh, humanity and become a different race in the next uh, five years. I think you'll be all right. Five years. That'd be wild. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> if you have unlimited computing and transmission of data, you know, cause that's the whole thing about the, the Neuralink is that, I mean, it's supposed to help people with um, um, physical disabilities that have been, you know, had nerve nerve pain, nerve damage and stuff. But it's also to re- remove the barrier of coding and encoding data through auditory speech and listening and the decoding. So, so what is the Neuralink? 
So, I mean, you you know more than I do about this whole thing, but it's one of the, I'm on overview. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'm I'm like a high level. Because what you're explaining sounds to me like what Stephen Hawking uses to like talk, like when it moves. But I don't think that's what you're talking about. Oh, I thought Stephen Hawking talked, typed with his eyes. Maybe. I I thought it was, I thought that they, they developed something that, I don't know, like some kind of sensor or wire that went in and used the the nerve muscles. nerves in the cheek muscle. So oh. when it twitched, it would speak. Oh, I I mean, um, possibly. I thought I thought that he was when he still had some mobility of oh. his of his mouth. That's what they were doing, and then at some point, he just had movement in his eyes. But I could oh. be wrong because if they were able to connect to like his nerves, then those are still you know people can still move their phantom mm-hmm. limb when they don't no longer right. have the have that um so and that's how they I'm wrong, control the robotics <laughs> i mean <laughs> and neuralink as far as i know is basically like creating these things that go into your brain and then it measures the firing of the synapses and stuff so awesome from that they can not see what people are thinking but like as a picture but see like either their emotions or what they're trying to do if, if it's a physical thing, um, you know, and I don't, I don't know the science behind it, but it's pretty cool. Um, hmm. And it has a, a lot of really great positive implications. And then also if you look at things in a dystopian way, it could be like terrifying because it could be like the downfall to all humans. <laughs> yeah. I mean, our, already we're already superhuman because we have the answer to every question we'd ever want. Plus we can, this is, ex, this is an external hard drive. When there's a mm-hmm. thought, something I want to remember, I punch it in here. And then when I want to retrieve it, I go to it and then I can remember what I was trying to think earlier. So, mm-hmm. so, but if we could actually literally just go whoop and stick that in there and then have access to the internet, you can just think of, anything you want to know and have the answer immediately. So then, you know, it's, you know, there's a synthesis of humanity. That might also have computing and technology, great social implications because then no one is really smarter than anyone else. If you all have the same in access to information potentially <laughs> possibly. And what it also has to do with what you were saying about that show upload is called uploaded upload about maybe only the wealthiest are able to get said implant and then really is it going to, you know, so, you know, right. you can look at anything as a positive or the, the flip side of it too. So, um, so what I'm hearing lot- is I should really start saving my money. So for when these things come out and I can afford them. <laughs> so now here's another thought, you know, how we kind of like bash old people for like, I don't want to get a smartphone. You know, people are just staring, you know, the older mm-hmm. generations are slow to adapt technology. And we think like as young people, we're like, I'm never going to get like that. I'm always going to be, you know, ready to adopt the newest and the latest thing. But then when kids, like when maybe when we're old and kids are like, you know, like mindless zombies synthesized with the internet and they don't have to go do experience things, we're going to be the old people that are like, ah, we still go Mm -hmm. out for a breath of fresh air and a walk around the neighborhood because like that's real. And And we talk to each other because we we have other things to learn. Yeah. We use words, you know, we we (laughs) sing songs, but like, but there's down the road, who knows, you know, like to, because of the rate of how fast technology develops, um, there probably will become a point where we become the grumpy old people. And we're like, I'm not going to get that chip in my head. You know, I, I'm good. I'm going to, yeah. I don't need to live in some virtual reality. Um, you know, I'm good with the real world. And, but then is there even a difference? And that goes into simulation theory and blah, 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 blah. We're going to be the old man that lives in the house from up. I can't wait. I can't wait <laughs> Me to be curmudgeon. Yeah. <laughs> I was just telling somebody that. Yeah. So, um, okay. Any, uh, any last little words of advice to um, kids in high school, kids in college that are maybe in marketing or, or in something, something related, or maybe they don't know what to do at all, um, how to get started and, and learn more? My biggest advice would be to take lots of courses, like ones that you don't even think that you're re- you might be that interested in because they might surprise you. Like I took one one brains class and it just changed the whole trajectory of everything for me. 
And, and I don't know, I found out that I was really interested in linguistics. And if you looked at my transcripts, you would have thought that was like my, my minor, or my focus. I really didn't, I'm still interested in that, but I don't know, just being open to taking different courses and learning from different people. Um, what else? I have something related to that. Okay. The, the best advice I ever got, well, not ever, but college related was if there's a professor at your college that's known in his or her respective field, take the course with them regardless talk to of, them. of that. Yeah. Yeah. Get to know them. Take the course regardless of whether or not that's in your major or in your program or on your track, just take a class. Cause you're going to learn something. That's exactly why I took, um, cog 435 cognitive science with Dr. Van Pola. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I was a broadcasting major, so I, I, you know, I was playing with cameras and stuff, but I took that class and I learned so much and it was so much fun. And, um, I, I regretted nothing. I'm super glad because that professor is, there's no reason for him to be at the school he's at. He could be teaching at, you know, Columbia or Harvard. He, or, he could be at such a bigger school. Or just doing research. We were, mm-hmm. we were so lucky to be able to learn from him. Mm-hmm. Agreed. And I'm sure there's many other professors like that around the country at schools where you're like, how did we get so lucky? <laughs> yeah. I feel that way too. He remembered mm-hmm. my name, you know, with having met me once six months prior and then he's like Tyler yeah. and I'm like, Oh my gosh. And that's what that like piqued my attention. And then from one there, the, I just learned how genius he really is. One of the things that I loved most about his style of teaching was that we had, I think it was, I don't know if it was just a regular test or a midterm in one of my cognitive science classes, but I couldn't, I studied so hard and I knew that I knew what the answer was, but I couldn't think of, like how to write it or what the actual term was. So I just wrote out and explained the whole concept to, he gave me full credit. He's like, it's more important to me that you can demonstrate that you understand it and that you, and that you learned it. And I was like, thank you. Cause most times they're just testing you on like right or wrong, black or white. They're, I think they're testing you on, the knowledge, but not the understanding. And it was more important that I understood. And I was like, that's how you all should be. Because that's more important. But yeah, he, I had, I commented on one of his Facebook posts a couple weeks ago. And another, another kid from one of my classes commented also. And he's like, I remember when you guys were sitting in my class for, semiotics at 8 a.m. spring semester 2013. I'm like, how do you remember that? You remember exactly which which class I was in, what time, what day, what semester, where I sat? So either he just has like a photographic memory or I just think that he, he just cares. Probably some of both because yeah, <laughs> yeah not the average yeah. person can do that. No. So yeah. any... Any oh go ahead. Um, one other thing that I heard when I was at Oswego, and it was from I believe Steve Levy was giving his speech at our torchlight ceremony, which is like this one was at the end of the year for the graduates that were leaving, and I was working and doing catering for it, so I remember listening, and I don't know if he was quoting somebody else. I think that he was that if you, this it just stuck with me. The, if you never ask, the answer is always no. Mm-hmm. So for, and I've kind of adopted that as like sort of one of my life mottos. So no matter what it is, like if you, do you want the job? Do you want more experience? Do you want more money, more pay? <laughs> yeah. Do you like, and it's just, if you never ask, the answer is always no. So at least try. Great advice. So, thanks to him for that. So any other last words for our listeners? I don't know. All right. Well, thank you That's for That's not a good on. answer. 
No, I mean, that's okay. <laughs> it's just an opportunity. Oh, do you want to, can people connect with you? Is there any way for people to uh, find sure. you? And uh, yeah, go ahead and let I'm people on, know. I'm on the LinkedIn. Sarah Coletta. All right. That's, yeah. Are you not cool my... with, Are you cool with people uh, asking questions if they're maybe interested in this career field? Yes. I'm always open to questions and I'm sure that I can answer them more directly <laughs> than I have on here. Well, thank you. Um, I'll add ahead. as much flair as I can. <laughs> uh, in upcoming episodes of the creative truth, I'll be talking to other artists, entrepreneurs, and creative professionals. I kept teasing UX designers. I'm super glad that Sarah finally got to come on and um, to help discover their path to success. So if you're watching this on YouTube, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And if you're listening on your favorite podcast platform, please leave us a good review. Uh, you can send suggestions for guests and episode feedback to wecreatetruth at gmail.com. And you can find us online at creative-truth.com.